In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, where a crowd of men and women, and yes, children too, they greeted Jesus' entry to Jerusalem as a king. And they laid a bunch of things under his feet, and they cried out, Hosanna in the highest. What exactly did they lay under his feet? Palms is the answer, you're right. But as with so many things in the Bible and our life of faith, the answer is one thing, but what it means is a whole nother thing. These palms aren't performance props, and they aren't artifacts in the Armenian Church Museum. They're supposed to be living reminders of God's ongoing transformation of the world. So let's do some recovery now to find out the sacramental aspects of palms. That is how they actually point us and bring us to God. So here's the surprising thing. If you open up your Bible and you read through Matthew and you read through Mark and you read through Luke, you won't find a palm. Not a single one. These evangelists, they simply wrote that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowds put their coats and branches underneath him. And this makes sense since these were likely peasants and they put down whatever they had, which was their cloak and the branches that had fallen nearby to try to properly greet this man who they thought was an otherworldly king. It's not until actually we get to the Gospel of John, the final Gospel, that we find the people waving palm branches. And this happens all the time in the Gospels, by the way. The Synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're very, written very close to the time of Jesus, and they tell things like a reporter would. Right? So just the facts with little editorial. John's Gospel, though, tells us the facts about Jesus and then it tells us why it matters. What do Jesus' actions mean in the context of God's relationship to man then and now? Why does it mean to the readers, and why is it important? And so John doesn't contradict anything that came before him. He just fills in details and context. People did lay branches, but they were palm branches. And this detail holds great significance in the story of Jesus and our church retelling of it today. And so to get to this lost meaning of palms, you should probably go to a trophy case if you have one. If you don't have one, imagine a trophy case. And think of all those painted gold little golfers or baseball guys or singers or gymnasts. Think of the Lombardi Trophy, a giant, I think, golden football. Think of the Stanley Cup, a giant silver uh, wedding cake cup. 2,000 years from now, I bet that people will look back at these objects and be as clueless about them as we are with palms. But of course, it's not the painted golden guy that matters, and it's not the palm itself that it matters. It's what it signifies, and this signifies Victory. Victory. You know, trophies remind players that they fought against all odds and emerged as the greatest. Palms did the same thing in the ancient world. The best athlete in the ancient world would not get a medal. They'd get a palm. If you were a really good lawyer and won a case against all odds, you might hang palms outside of your house or office. And most strikingly, if you were a military leader and you made it back home in triumph, you would be surrounded by palms. Evocative signs that the fight was hard fought and won, that you lost many, but in the end, victory. And this is why John recalls the detail of palms in his gospel and why we bless and raise and bring them home, our palms today, because these are symbols of the victory of Christ a conquering king and general who has utterly defeated the enemy. 
This crowd of his followers on that day, they were so sure of Jesus' impending victory that they're giving him a medal even before he finishes the race. Because, right, his betrayal and his crucifixion and resurrection, they were still days before him. But this crowd didn't see the need to get to the final victory. They knew he was a winner. They saw him heal the untouchable. They saw him love the unlovable. They saw him forgive the unforgivable. And probably they themselves at one point were the untouchable and the unlovable and the unforgivable. They had seen enough to trust in Jesus' victory without yet seeing the end. And isn't that just as we are today? We celebrate the arrival of Jesus and bring forth these palms. This is our tangible reminder that through history, uh, excuse me, that though history and our lives are not yet over, we've seen enough in Scripture, in history, in our lives to raise the palm of Christ's victory. Because no suffering and no horror and no hate has a chance at lasting because Jesus Christ has defeated evil for all time. And we say this quite aware that the world where Jesus' victory has begun has not yet at all been complete. A world of terrorism, a world of bombing civilians, a world of mass shootings, of addictions, of homelessness, of loneliness. And yet we affirm that Christ has defeated evil and death in the midst of terrorism and war and cancer and heart disease. How can we do that? How can we assert victory in a world that suffers like this? Well, the same way that the faithful people of Jerusalem did, and the apostles, and Jesus. The great suffering of Jesus and his followers was behind them, it was in front of them, and it was all around them on Palm Sunday, but the promise of God's grace and new resurrection life, that was stronger still. And that's the situation we share in today. We can live victorious in a broken world right now, without sugarcoating everything because we can look evil in the eye and we can not flinch and most importantly we can roll up our sleeves and get in the fight because Christians don't run away from suffering. They're supposed to run towards it to see how we can comfort, to see how we can help, to see how we can serve. What more can we do for Armenia and Artsakh? What more can we do to befriend and ice? Uh, befriend the, the isolated and the lonely here in this community? And how can we bring people together? There's a big one. In cities, church, and our own families when the enemy is constantly bent on dividing us. So we're called to live in the here and now in a world of sin and death, but we also are to wave our palms in victory. And we're called to be happy warriors, which I find myself very difficult to do. And that's why I need to not only imitate what the people of Jerusalem did in lifting up their palms, but I also need to imitate what they said. They said, Hosanna. And Hosanna doesn't mean we're number one, and it doesn't mean hooray. It means, in Armenian, get so dead, ye bormia. Lord, save us and have mercy. Because we on our own just don't have the courage, the grace, or the strength to joyfully wave a palm of victory in the face of evil. But Jesus, Son of God, working in and through us, He does. And so then on this Palm Sunday, let's live into the blessing of these these palms and call on God in a world full of suffering so that by His strength, we join the fight against sin and evil and follow our King to certain victory now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen.